Welcome to episode 9 of The Inner Sanctum, the internet's one and only dark ambient vlog. I am your host, my name is Joe. Well, it's February of 2019 and here in Wisconsin we are just really enjoying winter. Let me tell you, we've had several just tons of snow, it's been bitterly cold at times, it's been really warm again at times, it's been super slippery and icy, and let me tell you, here in Wisconsin, we love that sort of thing. And me personally, being a landscaper for a living, I love it just a little bit more, because I get to wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning and get to work at 4 a.m. to start uh, taking care of the elements and getting them off the roads, off of the sidewalks, so people do not slip, fall, or do any of those horrible things that can happen in wintertime. I'm joking completely. I do not like the winter anymore. I fucking hate the winter. I've had enough. I want spring to be here. I want it to be summer. I just want to go sit on a beach and drink a beer and I guess sit in the sun. I'm serious. I I can't do this anymore. I hate winter. I never thought I'd say that. Alright. Actually, I'm exaggerating there. I do still love winter, but just not in the same way I used to. I still like going hiking and just you know, getting field recordings and shit like that in the winter, but when you gotta deal with this stuff and really be in the thick of it when you're in the middle of a blizzard and having to do snow removal, it can really change your opinions of this thing. But before I just horribly diverge at the beginning of the show, let me say that since it is winter, since there's been a lot of snow here, let's uh, kind of theme this snow, this uh, let's kind of theme this show around winter and. I'm gonna talk about some releases that have a lot of uh, just a cold atmosphere to them and you know have winter in general going on. So before we get to the album reviews, I just want to kind of feel the question I've been asked uh, more than a few times and while I could have of course just simply emailed these people back or Facebook the message them back, I decided to make it a small little feature here in this episode of the Interstate because I've been asked this question a number of times, so what the heck, right? And, uh, you know, I've been trying to, you know, figure in more features for this show anyway, so I, we're going to start some things off a little bit differently, a little bit of a curveball again, but it's still going to be dark ambient related. So, we'll get to that in just a minute, but first, the beer of the show. Today's beer of the day comes from Octopi Brewing, which is a brewery in Wanakee, Wisconsin. I literally had no idea where Wanakee, Wisconsin was. I had to look it up at the map and just to find out that it's, uh... A little northwest from here, and uh, I, I don't think I've ever been there, but uh, I feel like I have to go there because this is a S'mores Stout, and this is fucking incredible. It packs a mighty 8% ABV, and surprisingly, it's very drinkable. It's uh, not that thick, and it just goes down real well. It's not super sweet or sugary. It's just it's very mild. It's a very great drinkable beer. It's not a dessert beer in any way. I mean, you could drink this with anything. I think you'd be okay in that. The s'mores taste is definitely there, but it's very subtle, man. It's just, it's a really great beer, and, uh... I had never even come across this beer or this brewery until last weekend when a buddy of mine was coming over. We were getting drunk and playing the new Resident Evil remake, and, uh... I was fucking blown away when I seen this. I would never had a s'mores, uh, stout before, and this is really, really good. So, highly recommend it if you're a, the beer drinker, and, uh... I mean, I guess this, I mean, I had never seen this in Wisconsin myself yet, so I guess best of luck finding it, but I'm sure it's around Wisconsin, probably around the Midwest. Uh, outside of there, I could always say best of luck to you, but definitely worth checking out if you are a uh, big time uh, stout and porter kind of fan. This is really great stuff from Octopi Brewing. S'mores. Alright, so a question I've been asked time and time again is, how do you get signed to a record label? I am by no means an expert in this area because I haven't actually worked with any of like the bigger labels out there, but I have worked with several smaller labels, so I can at least give you some insight into that and what my experiences so far to date have been like. So I think the, you know, the, the key thing to remember when you're searching for a record label for your release that you got to remember is that a label is putting their time, energy, and money behind you know, making a physical product for you. No matter what it is, if it's a CD, a CD, a tape, or a vinyl, you gotta remember that someone else is involved here and they're putting a lot of time and effort behind this. So if you send them something that isn't good, they're just gonna, you know, basically tell you, no, it's not good and we're not gonna do this. You know, we're not gonna sign you, or well, I guess not sign, but work with you and release your album. And, uh, 
I see it time and time again where people, you know, will say stuff like, well, why won't this label sign me or why won't they do that? And like, I think something like a lot of people overlook is that certain labels have a certain theme to them. I mean, take Cryo Chamber, for example. They want cinematic dark ambient music. They want albums that have a, a theme and a story to them. So if you just send them a basic slow droning ambient album, they're probably not going to sign you. You know, it's just not gonna happen. You can't expect it, and you can't get mad about it either. And, uh, I mean, yeah, I've sent my albums to Cryo Chamber, and Simon has turned me down a couple times. I'm not bitter about it or anything. I just realized I didn't make the album he wanted to hear, didn't, you know, didn't think it was gonna work with Cryo Chamber. You know, so, I mean, you can, I, I just, you know, you can't really get too upset about it. I, I don't, anyway, I try not to. And I mean, I, I have my opinions of, you know, labels like Cryo Chamber and Cyclic Law, and. Whoever else, you know, so I sent them stuff sometimes where I think like, oh man, this is gonna be down like it's been signed and it doesn't, but whatever, you know, it's I can't really hold the grudge or, you know, think that there's I did something wrong. Another thing to really kind of consider too is if possible, create an original album cover. I know not everybody is a graphic art designer or has any real talent for making that kind of thing, but if you do try to create something original. Something I see time and time again within not just the dark ambient underground, but underground music in general. People just want to go on Google and find, like, say, a classic painting to use as their album cover. I mean, that's fine if you want to do that, but it really, right away, immediately, like, you know, takes away a certain amount of your creativity. And I mean, yeah, there might be a painting out there or whatever else that totally just identifies with your music and fits perfectly, but. I feel like there's definitely something special in creating your own artwork, or if nothing else, hiring a graphic designer to do it for you, and I get it 100% that those things cost money, they can be very pricey, but if you, you yourself feel like you've created a great album, why not just take it a step further and hire someone and make these great songs, this great album you've created, and give it a good image too. I mean, you know, again, that, yeah, it, that, that thing costs money, but you know, it's just something to do. And I've done it in myself in the past. Two of my albums, I, I to my older albums, I hired a, uh, a small little private graphic uh, designer called uh, Glitch Witch to do it for me. I was 100% satisfied with the, the work Maya did for me. It was fantastic. It was exactly what I wanted. And you know, I think you know the artwork she did for Back to the Mud and, and Oblivion to you all definitely helped to make the album. Know, give it more attention. Um, you know, again, it all kind of depends on what your expectations for the album are. If you, uh, if you're just making music just to, you know, put music out there and just put tons of albums out there, well, maybe you don't need to hire someone. Maybe you can just, you know, you know, you can just grab these paintings or whatever else from the internet and then, you know, just put a little, you know, put a little credit on the album and Bandcamp. It's just like a digital thing. I mean, I guess it all just kind of depends on what your goals are. With Another thing too is, I see time and time again, people don't really have like creative song titles and it really bothers me. <laughs> I feel like if your songs have like the over, overly used uh, words like gray and black and death or something like that or depression or depressive, I feel like you're kind of doing it wrong. There's definitely much cooler words to use in your titles. and. I mean, you can still use those themes, of course. I mean, God knows I fucking do, but, you know, it's, uh, it seems like the words like black and death are always so overly used in underground music to the point where it's just, like, ridiculous, you know? Or the word dark. I mean, I, I know I've used all of these words in all of my song titles, but I think I've at least tried to add a little bit more to it to make the song titles a little more interesting and not to brag or anything, but some people have actually comment, uh, you know, complimented me on how good my song titles are. So I don't know, maybe I just got a natural talent for it, for it or maybe it's just because I've been listening to, you know, dark ambient and black metal and death metal for like 20 years now. So maybe it just, you know, it just instantly comes on my mind. I don't know. But another, you know, a great way to, you know, find song titles too sometimes is just read through lyrics from uh, black metal bands or even, you know, novels and stuff like that. And just take, you know, you could take uh, some phrase from a book or something and just kind of alter it a little bit. Or even, you know, you could even copy it even to a point and just use it, just pay tribute to that art, that author, or, you know, that, uh, anything, yeah, I mean, it's just, uh, I, I don't know, I just feel like bands just don't, aren't creative, as creative as they used to be back then, it's something really to consider when, you know, choosing song titles. Promo photos is another thing that's kind of a rarity in dark ambient music, and typically, a 
lot of dark ambient musicians either don't include a promo photo in the booklet or the layout of their album, or if they do, it's a really usually shadowy, obscured photo of the of the person. And um, I myself have usually kind of gone down the path of using these more, I guess, shadowy and obscured kind of look, you know, looks to my my promo photos, but. Something I don't think a lot of uh, dark ambient artists even do is really like, you know, include the photo themselves in the the layout of the album. And I, I don't know, I guess I just kind of perceive it from, you know, it's maybe more of a metal, you know, metal kind of standpoint where like, you know, metal musicians will always have a picture of themselves in the book, or usually do anyway. And uh, I maybe have broken, you know, a trend of not having that by almost always, you know, including a photo of myself in the layouts of uh, a lot of my albums. So. If you're gonna do a photo, and you know, again, this is something where I, I am, ta I guess, I have a talent as a photographer, so I can create cool, cool photos like this. Not everyone may have that talent, so if you want to get a cool photo, why not hire someone, you know, or find a friend that can just take a picture for you just to get a cool shot, you know. It's uh, a cool photo goes a long way. It's the same thing with the album cover, you know. Having an original cover, having an original promo photo, it definitely goes a long way. It's definitely worth it. And I think it will. It definitely will, you know, impress record labels when they examine your album for a possible release. So all in all, you know, don't expect to get signed to Crowd Chamber. Don't expect to get signed to Winter Light. Don't expect to get signed to Cyclic Law when you release your first album, or even your tenth album. It might take a, it might take years. All those labels have a, a very, you know, have a reputation at this point. They've been going a long time, and they have a, an audience that they have to please. And it, I think to a point, it's almost a business for them at this point, where they have to release great music. So. You know, don't be offended if they don't release your album. I'm no, I'm not. It's frustrating, of course, when you're searching for a record label, because uh, a recent release of mine, I sent about 25 different labels from, you know, the bigger labels to the tiny, obscure labels that no one even knows about and no one wanted to sign it, and it was extremely frustrating for me to do that. But I had the, you know, the talent as a photographer and a graphic designer to create a physical, in, for a physical product for that album in question, which is my uh, House of the Maker side project and the Immersive Repose album. I, uh, you know, I created this whole little small little package of them into 10 copies, but, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's just a fun little thing I like to do, because I just have that old school mentality where I, I want to have a physical product, something tangible, something you can hold in your hand, something extra to go with the music while you're listening to it. And I know, you know, digital's becoming the big thing nowadays where everyone just wants to download stuff and put it on their hard drive, but me personally, whenever I download digital files, they always sort of reach this point where I just forget about them. They're just, you know, they're just on my hard drive and they just, you know, if I don't listen to it enough, it just disappears, I guess, and becomes just another item on my computer. And, uh, of course, you know, the better albums I do download, I do sometimes burn to a CDR so I can listen to it in my stereo or in my car and stuff like that, but I don't know if everyone does it. Maybe not many people do that at all. Maybe they just prefer listening to it on their computers or on their phones. I, I don't know. I guess everyone's different. I don't know how people organize their digital libraries. I don't, uh, I have a really big one myself because I almost always prefer pre prefer a physical product. But you know, to each alone, I guess. To summarize everything, you know, if you aim high and you do all the things that I think I'm kind of mentioning this video, you might get signed to a big label like Crowd Chamber someday. So aim high, and you know, maybe things will work out, and you'll become a you know a better, well-known musician in the dark ambient scene. Or aim low, do jack shit, don't do a fucking thing. But you know, either either way, either path you choose, you can't really be disappointed. I guess there's no real middle ground here, not much anyway. Maybe the middle ground would be you landing up in small obscure labels your whole, you know, your whole music career. I guess if you want to call it that. Um, I don't know, but uh, yeah, you know, and uh, yeah, it is what it is. I guess kind of, you know, what you put in, you will get out. I think unless there's just something you're doing wrong in some other way. I don't know, it's it's hard to say. Everyone's different, everyone's, the results are different. Some people are lucky, some people are unlucky. I mean, I've been an underground music fan for many, many years now. There's been a lot of projects that have been enormously successful that I've seen since the beginning, and there's some projects that I just wish had taken off, they just never did, but maybe it had something to do with the artist behind it, and you know, something they did, I don't know, it's hard to say, but it's, you know. Like I said, aim high, expect maybe to get great things, aim low, maybe you should check shit when it. I don't know, it's hard to say. So, I don't know if that answers that question very well. I hope so. If not, um, you know, whatever. You know, maybe write me another comment in the, in the video. Let me know what you think about that. And uh, that's just my opinion, though, so take it for what it's worth. And it's, I guess, what I've done so far in my, you know, music career as not to look into. I've had the privilege of working with several small little labels, which have all delivered me a, a beautiful uh, final product in the end. And, uh, 
also done several self-released albums, you know, both as digital and uh, small little limited run physical packages, and uh, everyone's really kind of been satisfied with it. So, you know, I guess it all kind of depends on your talents to an extent and what you can do, but, you know, this is our life, you know, you gotta, you know, take chances and learn, teach yourself something new and just see what happens, you know, why not, right? You know, time, right now is a great time to teach yourself some time to learn something new, so why not, right, you know? So like I said, I hope this helps. I don't know if it does, but uh, you know, this is the question I've been asked a number of times, and uh, yeah, so maybe that'll help you get signed directly. Maybe not. I don't know. So give me your comments. Let me know what you think. All right. Up first is a project from Firenze, Italy, which I've known since 2006, when the project's mastermind Valerio Orlandini sent me several CDs, tapes, and digital singles for review on my zine, my, my old zine, Lunar Hypnosis. Um, I remember during the period of like 2006 to 2000, he was really active releasing a lot of stuff and I was very fortunate to get to hear a lot of it and get to, you know, review it and tell the world about it and I, I, as far as I know, those reviews probably helped the project out a lot and I, back then I kind of envisioned the project becoming really big one day, but I think at some point in time, Valerio kind of slowed down and concentrated on other music and eventually started his own uh, uh, other project which releases music under his own name, which I think is... It's still dark ambient, but maybe it's more experimental or something. I'm not really sure. But uh, the first proper album from uh, Symbiosis came in 2009, and it's called Slovene, and it was released by Frozen Landscape Productions. And it's a uh, interesting wintry polar ambient, as they like to call it sometimes, uh, dark ambient record, which uh, has, you know, it, it's less melodic as the older stuff, and at least in my opinion, more, I guess what I would call pure dark ambient. It, it, I've never, I, even though I originally, you know, thought of like the, the Burzum albums and the old Mortis stuff as being dark ambient, in retrospect, it's really not. And I guess nowadays they just, you know, refer to this stuff as dungeon synth. And, uh, but yeah, this record seemed like when he first really kind of started to make like more just pure dark ambient. It's, it's, it's a really great polar ambient record, which is features some minimal melodic uh, characteristics. There's some like, there's some martial product, percussion, there's some industrial beats, there's some piano melodies. It's pretty... It's a pretty solid record. It has a really just great, you know, just dark, uh, wintry atmosphere to it. Even though there's not any, like, really big uh, emphasis on, like, field recordings or anything like that. It just really, it really just comes naturally through the music. And it's a record I've listened to many times while on walks, you know, through the forest and uh, on wintry days, of course, and just driving around during winter and stuff like that. It's a, it's a great record. I pull out every year and I always enjoy it. And I think to an extent it's a very underrated record, too. And, uh... I think it's one of those albums where you can grab it off of, uh, you know, Discogs for just a couple bucks. It's, it's kind of been forgotten in time, which is a shame. It's a solid record, and uh, I wouldn't say there's necessarily any single, like, great track on this album. The whole thing flows very well, and it's a really great, you know, listening experience, which is, uh, although, you know, more rooted in traditional dark ambient vibes, it still has enough diversity to kind of really in be engaging, you know, keep you going the whole way, and, uh, yeah, it's a fantastic record, and, uh, I haven't really kept up with Symbiosis in recent years. I uh, was going to check out one of his newer records a couple of years ago, but uh, I never got in the mail, unfortunately. But uh, I think that record was a little more experimental, more with some industrial noise and stuff like that. So the project's evolved over time greatly, and uh, I don't really know how much music he, uh, Valeria is really creating these days, but I mean, like I said, back in the that mid-2000 range, he was recreating a lot of stuff, and there's a lot of great stuff out there to discover from this project, and you could, if you were interested in physical copies, I'm sure you can, you know, procure, procure it off of uh, Discogs for just a few bucks each, and it's definitely worth it.
cover. And uh, much like a project like Venturic, it, it has the whole, uh, you know, winter theme and winter photography throughout the album. And there's the... Up next is what I would probably have to consider not just one of the best Dark Ambient releases ever, but also one of the most important Dark Ambient releases ever in the Dark Ambient Underground. The album in question is the Nord Ambient Alliance, released by Psychic Law back in 2002. This was the second release for Psychic Law, and already in these early days of the label, it really predicted that this was going to be one of the greatest, you know, best Dark Ambient labels around, and obviously all these years later, that that point has been proven more than enough because this label has so many classic releases on it now and it's debatably the best dark ambient label ever, you know. Uh, but obviously Coleman Industry and Colorado Chamber have some pretty strong competition but I really think uh, Cyclic Law may just be one of the best dark ambient labels ever. Um, it's interesting because this, although some of these projects had some music out at the time, it was really, I think, this split that really kind of brought these projects to a greater audience through Cyclic Law. I mean, like, Predominance had a couple records out already on Loki Foundation, but then they, dis they disbanded right after this release. I mean, North Hound had uh, The Ominous Silence out a year earlier, and Camerite would really sleep in while hidden a year later, and Savartsen had uh, Devouring Consciousness out on Ibon Records, but, uh, you know, it was, at least for me personally, this was the record that brought these projects to my attention, and uh, as soon as I heard North Hound's contributions to this record, I went and bought The Ominous Silence. I bought Camar Heights, A Sleepin' Well Hidden a year later. <coughs> and, uh, well, a few, a few more years down the road, I finally picked up uh, Trace of Nothingness from Savartsen. But, you know, it's it was just a brilliant, wonderful collaboration, this uh, project from uh, Cyclic Law and these five artists. And uh, to me, this is definitely one of the best Dark Ambient releases ever. It's, although five different projects and two songs from each of those projects, incredibly cohesive and just the, the the dark mood and just the real coldness of the release just really is just it's it's impressively dark i love it it's it's by far one of the best records ever and uh it's just it's interesting seeing these very early compositions from these projects because like you know like, like i said instincts and camera i didn't have any albums out at the time so this was like the first real uh you know, uh, release from these projects, and the first time the world got to hear them, and my goodness, did this ever make an impression on me back then, you know? And I mean, one of the best things about this release, too, is it comes in this, uh, I guess, like, sort of tall digipack of sorts, and it has these cards, art cards that have basically pictures of the projects and some other artwork. It's a wonderful packaging, and uh, this is a record I've always listened to during the winter months. I It doesn't really resonate as well in the summertime. I've always listened to it every winter, usually multiple times, just, you know, when I'm reading, when I'm trying to sleep, I'll put it on. It's a great one to take on the car on snowy days when you're driving to work or whatever you gotta do. It's, uh, it's a fucking wonderful record. And it, like I said, incredibly cohesive in spite of the fact that it's five different projects. And, uh, 
The project, uh, well, the, I'm sorry, the album itself is has been out of print for many years, as it was limited to only a thousand copies. And uh, I, it would be amazing if Cyclic Law re-released this one day, especially if it was like in vinyl, even just a you know a normal digi pack, because it definitely deserves it. Definitely deserves to be heard. And uh, cause like I said, these are some of the earliest documented musical, you know. Uh, you know, songs from these projects, and definitely something that should be more readily available. And uh, yes, you can grab it from Discogs, but you're gonna pay like anywhere from 25 to 40 dollars. But I've seen lately when I check this, you know, when I just kind of check in to see. So obviously, not many people have that kind of money to spend on a CD. And you know, I mean, I know, I don't, I don't. Maybe you do. You know, I don't know. It all depends what your income is. I don't have that kind of <laughs> money to blow on CDs and, and on uh, CDs anymore. Unfortunately, like I used to back years ago when I lived with my parents and shit like that. So, um, you know, uh, but it, if that's the case, you know, if you can't afford the to pick up an old used copy, you know, you can definitely still download digital versions from Cyclic Law. It's well worth checking out. I mean, um, the, 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 this is just something really special about this release. I mean, it's just it's nostalgic for me to listen to this release. I mean, I can remember being, you know, I was 21 years old when this album came out. I just remember being, you know, that was during a time period in my life, too, when I was going through my phase of uh, pretty deep depression. And, you know, music like this, it, it balanced me. It had, you know, there was... There wasn't a lot of lightness in my life, but this strange balance of what light there was and this extreme darkness just really kept me going. I, I can't really explain that or put that in it, you know, say that in a way that makes sense, but, you know, uh, I was listening to so much dark music like that back then that I think, like, you know, the darkness pulled me under but still kept me alive. And it's, yeah, I just uh, have really special memories of listening to this album under so many different moods and. In some cases, I was also doing some really stupid things back then, like, you know, drinking while taking my, you know, depression meds and stuff like that, and, you know, creating some pretty euphoric effects as a result of that. And it's not something I'm proud of, but it's just something that happened, and uh, I just, when I, I listen to this record, I think back to those days and some of those kind of <laughs> stupid things I did back then, but, hey, it is what it is. We all have a past, and, you know, we do dumb things, we learn from them, so we move on and, you know, hopefully make better decisions, right? Like I said already, the packaging is incredible. It's, I think this originally came in a plastic sleeve, but somewhere along the way I lost it, which sucks because it's taken some damage over the, the many times I've moved over the years, but uh, not too mangled and the seat itself really re remains in great, pack, great, great condition. I can play without any skipping or anything like that. So here's the front cover. Um, you know, it's a, a photograph of some grim ass looking trees on a path in the woods, you know, and yeah, fuck yeah, man. <laughs> There's the back cover. And uh, it folds out to, uh, you know, here's the track listing for each of the projects. Northland, Predominance, Instincts, Kammerheit, and Sobartsen. And then there's another gloomy-ass uh, forest photo. And, uh, I'll show the art cards in just eight minutes. Here's the other side. Uh, Showing some basic, basic information for all the projects involved. And then in the middle there is where we have the CD host. Very cool. I mean, I, I love the whole package. I just, it's totally unique. I just not really, I haven't really had a lot of races since then that look like this. CD is just black, but has the Nord Ambient Alliance logo on it. And uh, now these art cards. This is really what's really awesome about this packaging it comes with these art cards and so there's instincts card
and Northaunt. With that classic picture of Harleth and Cattell in the misty uh, northern Norway landscape. Love that. Northaunt's the web address in the back. Sovartsen. That's just gloomy, desolate picture of Jan Roger Peterson. Predominance, predominances card. And of course, camera heights. The Master of Gloom, Har Bostrom. So, yeah, obviously if you're into physical packaging, this is definitely something worth, uh, you know, hunting down. And uh, I've said many, many times how much I love physical packaging, and this, this is, you know, one of my absolute favorites. Something I, uh, as soon as I saw it back there, I had to own it, had to have it. I remember paying, I remember paying, I think, a pretty good amount for this back then, but, you know, Again, if you're a collector of, you know, physical media, and I hope that a lot of people that watch their show do, you know, love physical media and still do buy it and support it, support small record labels and stuff like that, because it's definitely important. And, you know, I feel like if people don't support, you know, physical media, one day it's going to disappear. And that, you know, that, that, that very thought makes me really sad, just because I love physical passion. I love having something tangible. I love something to go with the music, and especially with these cool little things like these art cards. and unique package and it makes it all the more special and uh Nordic Ambient Alliance as I said is you know a masterpiece just absolutely you know perfect just great old school dark ambient music and a starting point for a lot of these you know, you know now legendary projects and uh if you can track it down you know you're gonna pay a little bit but it's definitely worth it one of by far the best dark ambient releases ever made it's Nord Ambient Alliance all right this is one of my all-time favorite Dark Ambien records. This is the album I first heard back in, I would say, probably 2001, 2002 time frame. And although just recently I just got my, my hands on a physical version of them, it's something I feel like I downloaded on Napster back in the day or something, and I burned to a CDR and just kept the CDR for many years until just recently I was like, all right, why don't I have a physical edition of this album? So I managed to find an original press on Discogs for a fairly cheap price, although the Digipack has some damage. So the question, the, the album in question is Apoptosis, 2000 release on Tesco Distribution, Nordland. This is, in my opinion, probably, probably one of the best Polar Ambient records ever released, with the only possible competition being Northon's The Ominous Sounds, which came out a year, or, year later. Both records are equally brilliant in that they have that nice mixture between like the melodic passages and the just the pure dark ambience. And uh, one of the things I really like about this record though is there's a lot more like martial percussion, just like these, I guess like you could say like epic moments and just this record just transports you to this just this, this barren, desolate, like wintry land and it just when it takes you there, it feels like there's no coming back from it. This is just unbelievably like immersive uh transportative just dark fucking music it is an incredible release and one of my all-time favorite albums this is another album too where like back in the day i <laughs> i was doing some silly shit like i was drinking a lot and tripping out while listening to this album so i have these sort of like uh, i guess like psychedelic memories connected to this record and just the trans you know the transformative kind of uh the mood this record has is just immense, and this is an album. I have a special memory of this album of you know going hiking very early in the morning during the winter and just see having this album in my ears and seeing the sunrise over Lake Michigan. Just this this album just playing in my ears and just, just just I don't know. It's this very out of body experience I had when I saw this. I can't even really put into put in perspective or give you an image or a video to kind of put you know make you understand but it was a really special moment when that this happened because there was a light snow happening and still the sun was out it was a really really special moment and it was a solitary moment no one was else around no one was in the park and, you know i didn't have a girlfriend or anything at the time it was a total isolation moment but i just felt like so alive in this moment this music was in my ears at the time and it was just unbelievable 
And uh, this is an album that, like I said, I, I had for many years just burned to a CDR like an idiot. I had some, you know, you know, low quality files, you know, of a Napster or something I downloaded. And uh, more recently, I came across a uh, version of it, uh, or the original version of it, on Discogs for a fairly cheap price, and uh, the reason why is because there was some damage to the digipack, but nevertheless, it's pretty much, you know, the original album, and it's all its glory, of course, I mean, whatever, you know, the little, little blemish you're hearing this, it, back here isn't too big of a deal, I guess. Um, anyway, this, this album is just, uh, it, it's so special to me, it's always been an album I've just loved, and, uh, like I said, very immersive, and very just, you can just close your eyes and just this album just takes you to this, just this, this, this dark, wintry realm, and it's, it's un, I mean, I, I love North Hans' ominous silence a lot, but this record just really has that same, just really immersive, and just bleak, dark, wintry landscapes, it's unlike anything I've ever heard. I mean, those two albums are just so special to me, just mean so much to me, and it's, you know, it's some of my most favorite music ever, and, uh, now, Pop to us as a band, uh, it, it after this album, they, they went for more of a, I guess, a hard edge kind of martial uh, industrial sort of vibe in the following album, where there was a lot of percussion and dark ambient sort of pushed to the side. Then the albums after that weren't really dark ambient at all. They, 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 it was something else. I have only briefly listened to it, so I can't really comment on it too much, but this is definitely the most dark ambient sounding record released by Pop, Pop to us, and it's by far. Uh, I think it's I think it's a masterpiece. I think a lot of people regard it as such, but I think it's still a little underrated because it's uh, kind of uh, it, it's because he only really did this one dark ambient record, and a lot of his other stuff is really different. So I think this album often gets ignored, and it's a shame because it is absolutely a fucking masterpiece. Like you know, with very little competition, you know, and. Uh, if you can get your hands on the original one, great. You might have to pay a little bit for it, but it was recently re-released in, uh, I think, at Tesco dis Distribution again a few years ago. I think actually with even some bonus track or a bonus track. So that version might be the one to hunt down. But since I heard this way, you know, all these years ago, I wanted to have the original pressing, just uh, you know, so so I can say I have it. I guess you know, it's something I should have bought back in the day, but just you know. Back in the early 2000s, I was buying so much music from so many different genres of music. I just, you know, you, you, you sometimes just overlook stuff, even though you're listening to, you know, a lot of records at the same time. You just, I don't know, it's hard to explain. But back in those days, it was a really special time for me. You know, even though I was in this dark place, it was uh, just down like this. It always, you know, really got me through that shit. So I love this album. It's a fantastic record. Well worth hunting down. If you can find one, or just go with that re reissue. It's probably a little more common than it easier to find the less money you're gonna pay for it. Definitely Nordland is a, a masterpiece of well. Front cover, and I don't know if you can necessarily see it, but the Nordland logo it has this embossed, uh, has embossed lettering on it, and if you, you know, it has that real nice kind of interesting feel when you put your finger on. It. Same thing down here with uh, the logo and the half moons. Interestingly, the cover, which features the hand showing the branch of the Elgi's rune. Uh, a year later, Kim Larson would use a very similar uh, image for the his second album under of, of the uh, for the of the Wand and the Moon project for his emptiness, emptiness, emptiness album. 
The photo on that cover shows him, you know, holding uh, a branch on fire with, you know, which looks like this, like this with the algae's rune. It's really interesting. So interesting that Apoptos is actually the first project that used that image, and then a year later, Kim Larson used something very comparable. So I don't know. It makes me wonder if, you know, he had heard this this band and they had gotten this album and liked and used it, or if it was totally just a coincidence they both both used it. A really special album for me and one that I hope more people can discover if they haven't already because this is a classic in my opinion and a must you know, be it the, this original pressing or the reissue, definitely worth hunting down. So, once again, that's Apophos' Nordland. One more album, and I'm actually breaking my winter theme I uh, originally proposed for this episode earlier, but I received this as a promo for review on the Inner Sanctum and well, I actually really love this album, and I just I feel like I have to talk about this even though I am breaking my theme, but whatever, it doesn't matter. <laughs> so, the only question is, Ashtoreth is Rights 1 and 2, the most recent release on Cyclic Law. Ashtoreth is a, a project that was founded back in 2010 by Peter Verwimp uh, in Brussels, Belgium, and uh, this is a project that has had numerous uh, CDR, limited CDR releases and so on and so forth with some small labels as well as independent releases that are uh, also in digital format. Um, Peter's music is largely guitar drone based and uh, the music kind of touches upon both like uh, prog rock, uh, post rock, some folk characteristics and of course just dark ambient drone based atmospheres. It's a really interesting CD and um, this is actually the only album I've heard so far so I don't know if older albums are different but this is a fantastic album and uh, it was a, a pretty big surprise when I first heard it because the album starts, starts out quite dramatically in a very uh, in a manner almost comparable to like the drone doom metal band uh, Sun and a really heavy really just with like like yelling, chanting kind of vocals at the beginning, but as the, the first uh, song progresses through, it becomes progressively mellower and more dark ambient and more dark droning characteristics. The song has just two songs, but each one is about 20 minutes long, so you get about about 40 minutes of music on this record, and uh, this album really takes you on this really immense journey. I mean, it has this sort of psychedelic vibe to it that really just takes you to that dark, really ritualistic kind of place. It's a, a shamanistic dream come true or a nightmare, depending on how you look at it. But a uh, really great dark atmospheric and uh, ritualistic sounding release, which is, like I said, completely guitar drone based with, uh, you know, multi-layered guitars and even, you know, normal, you know, well-heard riffs and stuff like that. But uh, it's a great record. It's uh, It starts, like I said, really heavy, but then as it grows, as the album goes on, it just mellows out to this really just meditative and just, I would say, somewhat more traditional dark ambient sounding release. But of course, you know, it's interesting because, you know, I don't think any synthesizers use it. It's all just guitar drones and just heavily, you know, processed, you know, kind of, you know, guitar pedal kind of stuff and all that, you know, kind of stuff going on here. And it's a, it's a release I've listened to numerous times since Peter sent it to me, and I like it a lot, and I definitely want to get my hands on more of his releases, because this is a fantastic release, and uh, 
I have to say it was sort of surprising at first that Cyclic Law released this because I don't, I'm not familiar with them normally releasing stuff that has some, you know, somewhat more uh, heavy kind of edge to it. But you know, as I guess, I, as I said, as this record progresses, it becomes more traditional dark ambient in, in style, and it's a really great release. And uh, definitely something hunting down, especially if you're into that more like drone doom kind of stuff. This is really great stuff, and uh, man. I definitely want to hear more from this project, but in the meanwhile, I'm definitely going to keep listening to Rice 1 and 2. This is fantastic, and another, just another brilliant find for Cyclic Law. I mean, these guys, I mean, man, what can I say? That label just doesn't release bad albums, and uh, Rice 1 and 2, which is also available on uh, vinyl, which I would love to get my hands on, uh, is uh, well worth checking out. But uh, I have a digipack here that Peter sent me, and I'm eternally grateful for this. Thank you, Peter. Thank you so much for sending me. I love this song. It's fantastic. And again, you know, if anyone's into you know more drone, dooms kind of stuff, guitar-based, ambient, this is a fantastic. It's well worth checking out. Fantastic, fantastic album. It's rights one and two, right? Astro. Here's the front cover of Rights 1 and 2 by Ashtoreth. It has this uh, sort of obscured picture of a moth on the cover. I like that one. Very cool. And the back cover. It comes in this really cool, nice little digipack here. It's one of the panels. And uh, right here, this has some lyrics, I guess, or, you know, but there's actually, actually, uh, any spoken passages in the recording, interestingly. Here's the other side, which has some recording information and such, all the good stuff. And then the CD itself. Is, uh, again, the moth. So, very cool record. Um, Definitely worth, you know, definitely worth checking out. Um, uh, you know, another great record for Cyclic Law. And a, a brilliant, brilliant uh, album for Ash Tourette. And I, I got to check out more from this project. And, uh, yeah, fantastic. So very meditative, psychedelic, and just dark and droney and ominous. And great stuff. So awesome work, Peter. I love this. Thank you. Thank you so much for sending me again. Awesome. Ash Tourette writes one, two. Thank you guys once again for joining in Inner Sanctum. I've reached the end and this is all I know for now, but I hope you had a good time as usual and uh, hope you didn't mind, you know, something a little bit different. I'm going to try and, you know, kind of talk about some different stuff in future episodes, not just always, you know, focus in on, you know, like the reviews and stuff like that. I want to, you know, have more, and you know, talk more about the, the different aspects of the genre, different things related. And I think in the next episode I'm going to show, like, my musical gear or something, just, you know, keep it, keep it diverse, keep it interesting, keep on, you know, just anything kind of related to Dark Yam, but keep it going, just make it really interesting, and, you know, I just hope you guys are enjoying this as usual, and as long as you do, I'm going to keep doing this, and, you know, if, if you don't, I'm probably going to still do it, because it's probably good for me to talk to, you know, uh, someone, even if it is a camera, it's probably helped my social skills a little bit, not being as awkward and stuff like that, <laughs> so, what the hell, right, you know, all right, so. Thank you guys as usual. Thank you so much for joining me in Inner Sanctum, and I will see you next time.
It's cold. We're fucking miserable. We're covered in snow. I hate. Oh shit! Fuck. <laughs> I hate fucking winter. <laughs>